Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of our Lunchtime Learning webinar series. Uh, we have a lot of new attendees and first-time attendees today, so I'd like to uh, say thank you for joining us today and for caring about sustainability enough to be here to learn more about it. Um, this is a series that we host uh, the second Tuesday of the month at noon. Uh, all of our previous um, presentations are on the Green New York website, so if you just Google Green NY uh, or you go to the OGS website and search for it, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, we have all of our previous uh, editions recorded that you can watch those there. You can share them with others. Uh, my name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the co-chair of the Green New York Operations and Engagement Subcommittee. Uh, we focus on greening state operations across all of our agencies and also on employee engagement. Um, and our next webinar, just so everybody knows, uh, is going to be in February is going to be on choosing greener personal care and cleaning products. So it's a topic that a lot of has been in the news a little bit. Uh, there's been some legislation on various things in New York uh, revolving these two product categories. So uh, we're going to break it all down for you next month as well. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started here. This webinar is being recorded, and as I mentioned before, you can uh, view it afterwards on the Green New York website. If you have any questions as we're going along, please type them into the chat box. I anticipate quite a few today uh, with the amount of attendees we have. So please type them into the chat box. I'm going to aggregate them since I get the feeling we'll have the same question come in a few times. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to have our presenters uh, answer all of your questions and we'll take time to get to those as well. So. Um, with that, with that uh, without any further ado here, uh, I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have Frank Mace and Chris Rogers from NYSERDA's NY Sun team. We're going to talk about how you can go solar for your home. So let's get started. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Frank now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brendan. We're glad to be here. Uh, we're going to, like you, like you said, we're going to primarily focus on uh, like residential opportunities and some of the residential programs. New York Sun uh, also has a lot of commercial and industrial work, but uh, for today, uh, we're going to stay uh, just on residential. So. Okay. So some of the topics we're going to look at today, we're going to, we're going to. Uh, Look at the uh, NYSERDA's uh, uh, New York Sun program, uh, specifically uh, residential in, in a typical home. We're going to walk through that process first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about green jobs, green New York financing. We're going to touch on some uh, what's going on in Long Island, what's offered down there. We're going to talk a little bit about low to moderate income uh, offerings, uh, community solar, uh, which is an aggregated system, and also uh, a program called Solar for All. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, New York Sun is, is really a contractor-based program, so uh, on our website, uh, we have tips on selecting a contractor. You must use an eligible uh, contractor in the program in order to qualify for all the New York Sun benefits. Uh, now, the contractors provide turnkey services, so they do everything from, uh, you know, the site assessment, design, construction, uh, interconnection, uh, commissioning. They do they, they do that whole process. Uh, so. Uh, the website will also give you information on the incentive that's paid. Uh, the, the New York Sun incentive is always paid directly to the contractor, and it's used to buy down the cost of your solar system. Uh, the contractors will walk you through the entire process and all of your different options. For example, uh, whether your site can, can do roof-mounted or ground-mounted, uh, whether it's going to be a direct purchase, a lease, or possibly a power purchase agreement. Um, and also some of the financing methods, whether it be private, a private lender that you're going to use, you're going to pay cash, or whether you're going to take advantage of the Green Jobs Green New York loans, uh, all those things can be worked out and, and provided by your, by your contractor. Now, per purchase systems that are directly purchased will get a five-year full parts and labor warranty, while uh, your leased and PPA systems will get a production guarantee. Uh, for the term of the contract, which is tr typically 20 years. Now, the reason for that is um, if, if the system that fails to work, your default is you go back to the utility grid uh, as opposed to having to have parts or, or, or labor to have it fixed. All right. 
Okay, so in addition to the actual incentives, there's other kinds of things that are not direct incentives in New York State, but they do help to pay for the cost of the solar. The first is the 26% uh, federal income tax credit, and the second is the 25% uh, New York State income tax credit up to $5,000 for your primary residence. So it's conceivable based on your system size that 51% of the cost of your solar you would have already paid in taxes at your income tax. Now this would be come back as a credit to you. In addition to that, uh, real property tax law, RP 487, offers a 15-year tax exemption on your real property taxes. Now, local school districts and municipalities can opt out of that, so it's good to know whether or not your school district or your town has opted out before you agree to sign up. Now, residents in New York City can get a real property tax abatement. It's a little different than the exemption. It actually lowers your taxes. The abatement will uh, keep it off the tax rolls for 15 years, the, the, but the abatement program in New York City actually reduces your, your property taxes if you decide to put solar on your home. In addition to that, New York State also has sales tax exemption on the uh, solar systems. So that 4% sales tax that is the statewide sales tax is exempt on all solar. Local and county taxes for sales taxes may apply. And again, you have to check with your, your local areas and your contractors can help you with that. And then in addition to the warranties that we discussed earlier, uh, often the manufacturers of the modules, which are the panels and, and the inverters, also offer extended or extra warranties as, a, as part of, with, for no additional cost, it's usually 20 or 25 years extra. So those are good questions to talk to your contractors about before you select uh, anything and you move forward to know if you have any long-term warranties on equipment. <clears throat> now, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, customer acquisition, and so we're going to walk you through uh, a typical type of uh, <clears throat> arrangement with your contractor. Now, all contractors may not use this process, but this will pretty much keep you uh, uh, what, what's going to happen. So typically, the co customer is going to ask, request a proposal from the contractor. The contractors will often use a satellite image to do an initial assessment of the property. And then the contractor will review uh, the customer's utility bills to kind of get a term determination on the annual usage that, that exists. And from there, they'll, they'll try to uh, size the system. They may also check your credit history and, also, and then they'll prepare you a quotation and uh, issue you a contract. <clears throat> the contractor will provide that initial proposal and present it to you for, for acceptance. And they'll review the terms and conditions of the contract and all, if all satisfactory, then you can sign that contract. Typically these agreements uh, are pending a structural, electrical, and an existing roof inspection. Uh, they, they have to make some assumptions at the time that they give you the proposal. Uh, these are usually not binding, it allows you both out. If they find, for example, if they find that the building structurally can't handle the system, it allows you both an out. But it gives you a preliminary estimate that they're willing to, to agree to under normal conditions. This is... Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the things that is used uh, to determine your output is they actually, behind the scenes, they're using 50 years of weather data to project the, the annual output of the system. And the reason for this is uh, there's fluctuations in the, in the weather, so these are actual estimates that you're gonna be given. Uh, the actual production's gonna vary depending on the actual weather. There's also seasonal differences uh, between summer and winter, for example. In the winter time when the sun is lower on the horizon uh, and you have less hours of sunlight, you're gonna get less production. So these are just uh, things that um, are part of the um, production. Okay, they also um, use something called the PV watch calculator. So part of the process, uh, after they've done the orientation and shading analysis, that information is inputted into PV watch, the PV watch calculator. Currently, this is all done behind the scenes when they put an application into us and it will give you an approximate number of kilowatt hours that the system will generate. This is then compared to your annual usage, 
And from there, you can determine what percentage of offset you're going to get on your bill. For, uh, not all customers are offsetting 100% of their of their electric bill, and it all depends on the available site, the uh, roof space or yard space, and also your personal finances, uh, what you what you wish to uh, reduce by. Okay. All right. So now the contractor uh, will do an actual on-site evaluation to examine and verify all the existing conditions. The contractors will identify the port point of interconnection with the utility. They'll look and verify all the structural components. They'll look at the age and the condition of the roof. And they'll also look at the electrical system to see if the elect existing electric service can handle this. So basically, they're going to verify what they did uh, on shading or take it to the next level just to make sure they have enough information for the design. <clears throat> the contractor will typically then discuss with the customer any substandard existing conditions and will attempt to resolve the issues. If they're minor in nature, oftentimes the contractor's not even going to bother. They're just going to take care of it. Uh, but it is possible that, for example, that they may recommend or they may say that you need to put a new roof on, upgrade your electric service, or do additional structural reinforcement before the project can proceed. If the existing structure passes the structural, electrical, and roof evaluation, it's then turned over to the designers, which are the engineers and architects, which will complete the design drawings and specifications. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about understanding your electric bills and net metering. Uh, during the day, the power that's generated by your PV system can be used on site in your home with any excess power being put back onto the grid and used by your neighbors. This excess power is, created, is credited on your account and then can be applied to your bill at night or when the weather is blocking your production. For example, if you have snow on the, on the array for two days, you're not going to get production. So anything that you get credited on, you, you can use at that point. So systems installed and interconnected this year in 2020 will be eligible for 20 years of net metering credit with no true up and no balances carried forward. Or right now, the balances will carry forward. I'm sorry. Uh, now, after the 20-year period, it's still to be determined what the actual reimbursement method will be then. But for right now, we know we have 20 years of net metering. OK. Um, <clears throat> the contractor will also get the permit uh, when we talked a little bit about it, it's a turnkey, they're going to take it all through the whole process. Once the permit is issued by the local authority having jurisdiction, the installation of the PV system can begin. The contractor must also supply uh, the inter or apply for the interconnection with the utility and receive what's called a PTO or permission to operate letter from the utility, and also the net meter must be installed. It's important that the systems not be turned on prior to the net meter because it can mistake your uh, production for usage and your bill would actually increase. So you want to make sure you don't turn them on early. Let the contractors do that. Um, the authority having jurisdiction will then complete you know, the code review and code inspection uh, and sign off on it. NYSERDA, in the New York Sun program, we have an internal QA process where we may select a project for our, one of our QA inspections. Uh, and that is a sampling rate depending on the volume and some other factors. All right, so Green Jobs, Green New York. We're going to talk just quickly on that. Green Jobs, Green New York, <clears throat> there's basically two loan products. One is the Smart Energy Loan, and that's either billed monthly or automatically withdrawn from your checking account. And the second is an on-bill recovery loan. This payment is actually an assessment on your utility bill. The, the, the big difference between the two loans is one is uh, on the, the customer. The first loan is, the customer, is a customer loan. The second one is tied to the utility account. If the house is sold, the, the bill goes with the house um, as part of the closing. All right, so loans can range anywhere from as low as $1,500 to $25,000, and they allow 5, 10, or 15-year terms, and these are considered unsecured loans. The rates vary based upon the payment type being 
pay on bill, auto pay, or pay by mail. And also the rates will vary based on household income. Lower income households will receive a lower interest rate with the Green Jobs Green New York loans. And as always, uh, with any loan product, there's always rules, special rules with those products, and you can uh, find those addition, those, you can find additional information at that link below on this page. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Chris, and he's going to take it from here. Thank you. And Chris, you should be good to go. Thanks, Frank. And or although Frank, I think there's a the little bit. I don't know if you want to talk through the the storage component as well, and I can jump I'm right sorry. in. I'm sorry. Yes, let me do that really quickly. Um, Long Island uh, and PSEG customers, PSEG customers on Long Island have transitioned away from the solar PV incentives. Um, solar PV on Long Island is now cost effective without incentives, so that's a good thing. However, storage is now incentivized on Long Island when coupled with solar. So we're seeing combination solar storage projects in Long Island. Now some <clears throat> customers may, uh, customers can have uh, battery backup systems for resiliency and all New York State customers can add storage to any PV system. However, Long Island is the first to actually offer an incentive. On the left, we see a traditional charge controller and battery setup. This is a typical uh, for emergency uh, backup panels and also some of the off-grid systems. And to the right, we see more sophisticated energy storage with a digital control. And this is the Tesla, Tesla model with the Tesla gateway in the uh, te Tesla power wall. And these are actually controlled uh, digitally as opposed to uh, just a, a real simpler system. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. And, and so just as a, a quick recap here, so the overall New York Sun program, you know, it, it began as a, a Governor Cuomo initiative of with a $1 billion, um, I guess, a fund to with a target of 3 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2023. It's expanded now to 6 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2025. And it really just functions as an incentive or a rebate program to reduce the overall cost of grid-connected solar systems that are installed by New York Sun approved contractors. You know, thus far we've installed, I think, a little over 100,000 um, uh, retail or 100,000 installations in totaling over two gigawatts of installed capacity. And the way the low to moderate income solar programs uh, work is that they, they increase these incentives that are in place for the low to moderate income community. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through a few examples of what these increased or enhanced incentives for the low to moderate income community look like, as well as, and then transition into talking a little bit about community solar and our new low income focused community solar program called Solar for All. And so to to start off with, so it are all of our low to moderate income programs, they start with an assessment of the, the income level of the individuals that are available for folks who are at 80% of the state or area median income or below. And what this works for the, the residential sector, we have the affordable solar program. And so for individuals who are at households of one to four family homes, you know, for them, they have a higher standard incentive. Instead of the 25 cents a watt that you would see in the Con Edison service territory or, in, or the 35 cents a watt in the upstate region that goes up to, to 80 cents a watt within, you know, within both Con Edison and upstate and on the Long Island where we we, where there are no more solar funds or solar incentives available, actually for folks who uh, who qualify as 80% of the state or area median, median income, they're eligible for an incentive through this program. And all a customer needs to do, as Frank alluded to, is they need to find a New York Sun approved contractor. There's also an income verification process that's handled by a separate entity. And that allows uh, them to verify that, 
you know, they're eligible for the program and they get these these had added incentives. And so, you know, the question is, what does that look like exactly? What are these rebates? And and what it means is that if you had a system of around six kilowatts, or, which is six thousand watts, you know, the, the conservative estimate for that system might be around twenty-seven thousand dollars for a system that's installed in in the the Con Edison or New York City or Westchester territory. The the added incentive for for folks who qualify for the affordable solar program would take that up to around forty-five hundred dollars or forty-eight hundred dollars, and that would reduce the system cost to around twenty-two thousand dollars from around twenty-seven thousand. And on top of that, that that a customer would also be eligible to apply for federal or state tax credits, which can reduce the overall system cost further. And, and so if you, if this same household were not to qualify for the affordable solar program, they'd be eligible for around 1500 within the Con Edison service territory and 2100 within the upstate region. And and the affordable solar and our, our low to moderate income programs, you know, what they do is they, they increase that rebate that that household could expect to receive. And so in addition to the affordable solar program, we have a an analog within the multifamily housing sector, which we refer to as the multifamily affordable housing adder. And it functions largely the same, except that instead of, you know, the court requirement being that the the household income is at 80% of the state or area median income, there must be the these projects must be cited on regulated affordable housing, which contain those income eligibility restrictions of, of typically 80% of the state or area median income. And, and, you know, the way that customer would apply in that situation is exactly the same as for all new solar projects is first, they would need to find a contractor, which is it's similar as similar to how you would find a contractor for any major capital improvement if you're trying to find a boiler um, or, or a contractor to install a new boiler. Same thing for finding a new um, solar contractor. And this would provide an additional incentive on top of what you would expect to receive that's capped at around 50 kilowatts. And, and so, again, the question is, what does that really translate to for the customers who who are trying to develop projects on multifamily affordable housing? Well, suppose you started with an example of, of a project that's around 33 kilowatts. A, you, a conservative estimate for that system might be around $150,000 within the Con Edison service territory. The standard New York Sun incentive would be a little under $17,000. Um, currently, the incentive is at $0.50 cents a watt. And the multifamily affordable housing adder would provide an additional um, $16,750 on top of that. In the, so the total incentive for that customer would be $33,500, reducing the system cost from around $150,000 to closer to $116,000. And then that customer, again, they would be eligible to apply for federal or state cat tax credits or tax abatement, which could further reduce the overall cost of the system. And so in both programs, what the New York Sun incentives are providing are financial incentives that are providing a rebate to reduce the overall system cost to make it more affordable and more accessible for a, a broader range and a, and a broader community. And in addition to these financial incentives, we also operate the Affordable Solar and Storage Pre-Development and Technical Assistance Program. Um, this program is slated to reopen in spring of this year, but it provides grants of up to $200,000 for the the implementation and development of solar and or storage installations that are located either on affordable housing or installations that will offer benefits to low to moderate income households. Um, thus far, the, the first round of this program, we received uh, or we have around uh, 20 projects. It was open for around two years and, and we had a, a good mix of projects based both in the Con Edison region as well as upstate, and we're looking to expand that further, as well as there's the change now that storage is an approved technology because we're looking to encourage the development of, of projects that have a resiliency component in addition to the traditional cost savings that you would get from a solar program. And so with that, I, I want to transition into community solar. So for, for those that aren't familiar 
um, you know, what community solar is. I, I, Frank briefly mentioned it, but essentially it's a, a solar installation that's located somewhere within the same utility service territory that you're in. You know, the, the, the community solar farm starts generating electricity. You pay a small subscription into that, or you pay a subscription into that farm, and you receive credits on your electricity bill. You can be a homeowner or a renter. It doesn't matter. Um, where you are, as long as you're paying your own your own electricity bill, you can participate in a community solar farm, and you can receive the benefits of uh, solar power. Um, the real benefit here is that a community solar project can be located anywhere where there's space, and so anyone who's concerned about the, I guess, the structural integrity of their roof or or, or whether or not they would have permission to, to build a solar farm or, excuse me, a solar project on their roof, they don't have to worry about that. They just need to, to find a community solar project. They subscribe to the project, and they can get the same, you know, 10 percent savings on their electricity bill that they would otherwise get if they were if they had a solar project installed on their home and you know these projects you know they can you you've probably already seen them without realizing them because they can be located anywhere they can be on the roof of a building they can be in the, the middle of a field they could be integrated within infrastructure such as a, a parking canopy um, you know for for those who are based upstate you know this is an increasingly common sight to see you know a, a large field with uh, with solar panels in them and and it's a it's a real growing industry that we're really proud to support um, via the New York Sun program, um, and that's a I guess a nice transition into the Solar for All program, which really takes advantage of the flexibility of community solar to provide direct benefits to the low income community. And what Solar for All is, is it's essentially it's a state-administered utility bill assistance program that use community solar projects to provide credits at, at no cost to to participants who are at 60% of the state median income. And what you see on the right there is a is a map of 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 where we have coverage. In, in order to subscribe to a project, you need to be within the same utility service territory. And so the areas that are in white, we don't have projects yet, but we're, we're looking to expand there soon. Um, so the most notable exceptions are we don't have any projects within Con Edison um, or in the Rochester area. And Long Island, it is not anticipated that we will have any projects there going forward. But we, so we're looking to, to fill the, the gaps that we have in the upstate area, specifically Rochester, and the Con Edison Service Territory, um, but not Long Island. And basically, the the way it works is once a an interested party, um, you know, submits an application for a program, they go through, they provide proof of their income, establishing that they're at sixty percent state median income, and then they re they'll receive around five to fifteen dollars on their electricity bill for for ten years. They can leave at any time. There's no upfront cost or fees. Um, you know what you'd see on on the left there. It, it's it may be hard to see, but you know it's it's um it's kind of highlighted in a, a red circle is is what you'd see is the CDG generation credit. You know that's that's what right now that's what a, a couple thousand customers we're seeing right now who are enrolled in the program are seeing on their electricity bill every month and and more are coming into the program at at any time for for community solar in general the the only difference between that and, and solar for all is that if you qualify based off your income for solar for all you don't have to pay anything into the program for community solar you would have to pay a subscription to the company that is managing that project in order to receive those discounts on your electricity bill and with with that out of the way um, i'd like to to say thank you again for attending this webinar, and and I guess uh, Frank and I are happy to answer any questions. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thanks again, Frank and Chris. And we have quite a few questions here, so we'll try and get to them all. Um, the first one we have here is, what does a contractor need to do a credit history check for you? Is there any kind of standardization on that? No, it's just, uh, you know, contractors are independent business people and they are not going to extend uh, credit to somebody that's not credit worthy and, and waste their time. Uh, so oftentimes they'll do a quick credit check just to see if it's a serious customer and if they have the, uh, the wherewithal to go through with the project. Mm -hmm. 
Are solar shingles included in the incentive programs? They would be, but there's not a lot of manufacturers currently manufacturing them. Uh, the one downside with a solar shingle is they're more of an architectural product, and if the system, uh, if the manufacturer decides no longer to uh, produce them, now you have a mis mismatch if you need to make any kind of repairs or adjustments or changes down the road. So we haven't seen a lot of them. There are some out there, but uh, customers should really understand that it's a very customized kind of product if they go that way. Mm -hmm. um, are the Green Jobs Green New York loans for anything other than solar? Uh, yes, I'm not an expert, and Chris, correct me if I say something wrong, but I believe there uh, also can be used for uh, other energy efficiency and improvements on your home. And that's my understanding as well, that there's also an energy efficiency component, although I'm not as, as well versed on that side as the solar side. Mm -hmm. um, so what is more cost effective in your average um, kind of installation here, um, installing sol uh, storage or selling it back to the grid if you have excess power? Uh, without a doubt, selling it back to the grid is more cost effective. Uh, to add storage to a system is, is very expensive. And if you're only doing it for resiliency, there may be uh, cheaper options for that. If you're doing it for other reasons, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of people doing storage that also have electric vehicles and things like that, and, and they're really uh, moving uh, the point at which uh, their usage is later in the day. So there, there, there's other advantages, but um, resiliency is one of them. But again, <clears throat> with storage, uh, capabilities. If you have a blizzard, uh, until the panels get cleared, you're not getting any production. So if you're if you're buried for a couple of days, uh, you you you're, in order to size your batteries to accommodate that, it can be very pricey. Mm -hmm. uh, can panels be ground mounted as well as roof mounted and receive the incentive? Y yes, they can. Uh, they can be uh, like a, a ground-mounted uh, array, but they can also be like mounted on a pole. We see that. We see some tracker systems out there which will actually follow the sun, and then we'll ha see them on, on rooftops. Mm -hmm. uh, do any of the benefits or incentives apply to new home construction? <clears throat> yes, they would. Um, uh, it gets more difficult because the incentive, uh, it, it, it's harder to build it into the, into the mortgage if, if a person's doing a mortgage, uh, because of, of the ownership, you have to own, this, own the home and put the system on it, and when it's packaged together, it makes it, it, makes it more difficult uh, from a financial point of view, but it's, I'm not saying it's impossible. Okay. Um, is community solar only for low-income households? Chris, you want to no, take that? You no, know, community solar is for any homeowner or renter Who's, who's interested, you know, you just need a community solar project within your utility service territory, and you can, you can sign up. Mm -hmm. there's, there, the there's Solar for All one. program is only for low-income customers, yeah. but community there's solar only, in general is for anyone. I'm sorry, there's only one restriction on community solar that I'm aware of because I have solar on my home, and I don't offset 100%, and I'm not allowed to buy the, the difference between what I'm producing off of a solar uh, 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 community solar project. That may change someday in the future, but right now um, there's a restriction on that. Mm -hmm. Are there any best practices recommended when looking for a contract or, for example, getting three estimates or things like that? There's a, there's a whole uh, uh, t bunch of tips on our website that walk you through the process as far as how to select to find a contractor, uh, what, to, what questions you can ask them. Uh, references are, are critical. Uh, looking at their history. We also initiated a few years back, we have a quality solar installer designation on our website, and that tells uh, customers that um, in order to get that, they had to, the previous year, score a high enough uh, number on our QA program uh, to show that they develop, or that they consistently deliver uh, quality systems. So that's one of the, one of the things you can look at. Mm -hmm. Um, are all homes and territories in New York State suitable and eligible for NYSERDA incentives? Are there any issues with the utilities in terms of capacity or having to upgrade substations or anything like that? Kind of like uh, uh, I know in the commercial market there's the VEDER proceedings and things like that. 
Yeah, typically in residential we don't see those things. There are some, there can be some uh, issues in some of the inner cities on the old networks, but uh, typically we don't see those, those problems with interconnecting. Uh, there are some instances uh, on commercial, but uh, often they're pretty small. As far as from an incentive point of view, other than the incentives have pretty much uh, run out in Long Island, uh, we do allow uh, uh, statewide, we can do uh, NIPA customers, we can do uh, Muni customers. The, the, the problem we run into with municipal utilities often is that they, they can't offer net metering to the customer, which makes it no longer cost effective, and most Muni power is already hydro in New York State, so they're, they're just switch, they we switch one renewable for another one, so there's not a lot of benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, and that actually segues well into the next question is, can you explain net metering a little bit more? I will try. Um, net metering is a virtual way of doing it where it's as if your meter spins backwards. So when, when you're not using all your production, it takes your meter backwards, but it really um, doesn't. There's really two meters that are working and, and, and you're working on the differential between the two is how it's calculating your bill. But um, it's, it's as if it went backwards when you're putting power into the grid and then you get that credit back when you, use, when you use the power later at night or when there's storms or things like that. So in the end, you're offsetting the kilowatt hours used and when you offset the kilowatt hours, you also offset all the other fees that are tacked on to your bill. Anything on your bill that says uh, kilowatt hour uh, next to it is going to be reduced. Mm -hmm. So there's two questions here about uh, roofs. Um, are there any issues that you've run into or any kind of warranties or anything else um, when they install roof-mounted systems? Um, you know, what kind of holes are they putting in the roof? What happens if the roof has to be replaced before the panels and things like that? Roofs are probably up there is, is, a, is a pretty common issue that we run into in our QA program, and we work very hard with our contractors to get it right. Uh, flashing details are critical that we do the flashings and we do all our roof penetrations correctly. Um, there's the New York State building codes. Uh, the Uniform Building Code is very specific on what can and cannot be used on a roof, and um, we, we make sure they do that. The age of the roof is significant because these systems are going to last at least 20, 25, maybe 30 years on a roof. If your roof is, you know, at a certain age, 15, 20 years old, um, chances are you may want to replace it beforehand so that you're putting it over a new one. Um, and then uh, it's important, again, that we use reputable contractors that know what they're doing that can get in there and make sure that they're properly sealed. Mm -hmm. Now, is there any kind of a list of approved contractors on your website? Yes, yes. There's, uh, you can go to uh, the New York Sun program and uh, search for find the contractor. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question here, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Uh, the next question here is about the Solar for All program. Uh, this person heard that it pays for the first 1,000 kilowatt hours of usage per year. Uh, is that accurate, and is there a good way to explain uh, the savings to potential applicants? Uh, you had mentioned 5 to $15 in savings per month. Um, is there anything more specific in terms of averages? There's... You know, there's there's not anything more specific in terms of the average savings that a customer will see because it's going to depend on the actual production of the community solar project. And so production goes up in the summer months, and that's when the the savings that they'll see are will be closer to the $15 a month, maybe a little higher, and they'll be lower in, I, I think, from January, really December to February is when solar production bottoms out, and that's when it's going to be closer to, to $5. But it's entirely dependent upon weather patterns and and um, and geography of the solar system itself. And so we're, we're estimating around 5 to $15, and that's been matched thus far in the customer bills that we've seen. Mm -hmm. So the next person here owns a townhome with a deed restriction from the city prohibiting solar. Is, do you have any experience with municipalities uh, rescinding such restrictions? Um, I'll, I'll talk about this. I've worked a lot with uh, homeowners associations and I've worked with sometimes with, uh, with uh, towns on their local, local laws 
And uh, first of all, uh, community solar is always available to them because <laughs> it's physically not located on their property and it's a virtual uh, net metering type of arrangement where the power is being generated off site and they get credit as if it was on their building. So that's the one option. When you deal with homeowners associations, it's almost, um, it's easier for them to change their rules and I understand what they're, what they're doing from an aesthetic point of view. They don't want all these different kinds of solar systems on their, on their property. So what we often do is do something uh, where um, they can actually put an RFP out and find a contractor and specify a product and then everybody can, can either buy or lease or whatever, uh, but they're getting similar looking things. That's one option. Uh, historic areas are really probably the, the most uh, likely to have a restriction on it. Um, uh, but, you know, again, uh, deed restrictions, you know, homeowners, when they buy in, they, they understand those and that's what they've, they've bought into. So we don't usually tell them what to do. We don't, we don't try to tell a community what to do. We can advise them and give them options. Mm -hmm. um, so this next question gets into um, climate change. Do you know with the, um, have you seen any climate models out there for how climate change is going to infect, affect the output of solar panels in the future? I, I have not, Chris May. Uh, one thing to understand about PV modules is PV modules are a solid state device, and as such, they're temperature sensitive. The higher the temperature, the lower the output. So the, when we design our systems in New York State, we actually design around the coldest day of the year because that's when it's going to have the highest instantaneous output. And even though we'll have less hours of sun, it will be the hottest. And then in Arizona, for example, where the temperatures are hotter, they are, they're going to have more hours of sunlight, but their outputs are going to be restricted because of those temperatures. So there probably could be something, but again, uh, when we do the modeling, they're using 50 years of weather data at this point. So, um, you know, um, and we do things, for example, the, uh, the, the arrays are always elevated off the roof like three to four inches off the roof that allows for cooling underneath. It helps cool the, so the solid state nature of it and uh, allows it to run more efficiently. Mm -hmm. I would say to that, you know, that's something that I think California is really leading the way in in terms of modeling the impact of, of changing weather patterns that are predicted as part of climate change. They're, they're projected to have, I believe, a larger impact on on wind resources where it can maybe shift that a little bit and there can be some changes that will impact solar. There is, I am, I am aware that there is some research that has been done at a nice sort of internally, but you know, thus far I believe that the, the projected efficiency changes aren't sufficient enough to change what we have as part of the, the model that we make available in terms of the value stack calculator, which models the anticipated value of this solar generated for you know, it typically is used for the next 25 years, and, and there's not, I don't believe that there's been, there's been data within New York that, that shows that it'll be, or, or there have been conclusions that it'll be too big of a change as of yet, but I believe it's something that we are working on internally, though. Mm -hmm. um, are there any incentives for solar thermal installations? Uh, this is Frank again. There, there was solar thermal installation incentives a while back. Uh, a lot of the air source uh, hot water heating systems have gotten hot, more uh, improved improvements and have displaced a lot of that market. Plus, there's a lot of moving parts in solar thermal, and it, it is not as popular. So currently, there is none. Um, the technology is still viable, but there's no incentives currently. I, I'm not sure if there's tax credits. There may still be tax credits for it. There it, solar thermal, though, is an approved technology to be supported by the Affordable Solar Pre-Development and Technical Assistance Program, but it's not a set incentive in the way that the New York Sun Standard PV photovoltaic incentives are. So you you can apply for a grant under the Pre-Development Program, but um, as Frank mentioned, there are not there are not any sort of incentives otherwise. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you describe the megawatt block grant as they relate to incentives? I'll try, and then Chris, jump in. Um, the way the megawatt block sets up, and, and what it is, is, is the, uh, the incentive pool is divided into different, different groups or blocks, 
and each block is assigned a number of megawatts based on the incentive rate. And as you fill that block, you've committed projects to that block, uh, and we commit them at the time they apply, not at the time they're completed. At the time they're completed, we pay for them, but we commit the money up front, uh, and then as the block fills, it automatically will, will step down to the next block. So uh, the megawatt block is how many megawatts at how much of a rate, are we going to take before we move to the next block? And this is a, it's a real-time count uh, dashboard kind of counter, so that as applications come in throughout the day, the block changes. And um, you can look at the history of past blocks and look at how long it was open before it closed and how many megawatts were issued during that period of time. Mm -hmm. So the next question here, um, I think this is getting around to the issue of islanding if you have solar plus storage. Um, are any of the utilities at the level where they have uh, microinverters that they can continue to allow the home to use its own electricity during an outage? <clears throat> um, first of all, uh, traditional microinverters or any inverter uh, cannot produce a sine wave. And uh, it's a kind of what, almost like a dumb technology. It has to mimic the utility grid sine wave in order to produce power. In doing so, they, um, they prevent them from accidentally feeding out into the grid. Now, the, uh, the way the traditional storage systems are set up is usually there's a critical load panel set up with battery backup. So with a transfer switch arrangement where you disconnect from the utility, you switch over to your batteries in your PV system, and working with a charge controller, which is like an enhanced inverter, you then generate power and you store the power and you work almost like an off-grid system. The Tesla gateway is similar, but instead of a traditional transfer switch, it, it digitally controls the amount of flow in and out of the grid and from the batteries in the solar. So it's, it's similar, but it's done on a, on a, on a, on a um, digital basis. It's more high tech. Uh, but there is nothing currently that would work both anti-islanding and produce power at the same time. You, you can't have an off-grid system connected to the grid is basically the, the right now. Mm -hmm. uh, approximately how much does one of the storage units add to the cost of a solar system? A Tesla, uh, a Tesla power wall? They're about, I believe, last I looked, they were probably in the eight to $10,000 per a piece range, and we see them with one or two, you typically on a home. Uh, and on a large home, you may see four. Mm -hmm. um, this next question uh, asks if there are incentives about geothermal as well, and I will preface this by saying um, our May um, presentation is actually going to be from NYSERDA's uh, Renewable Heating and Cooling Team, um, so stay tuned on that one. There will be more information on uh, geothermal and um, air source heat pumps as well in May. Um, another question here about EV charging stations. Um, can you include these in the installation um, as a package from the contractor and still apply for incentives? Yes, they, they can be included in. Uh, it won't change the incentive because the incentive will be there, but oftentimes, uh, like I said, contractors can include other things that are necessary. If, if the purpose of the solar is because you're putting an EV in, then obviously you're going to want that. Uh, you're going to want that on your on your um, on your on your system. If I need an electrical upgrade to my electric service, uh, that is also going to be in the proposal. You know, so. Mm -hmm. And with that, that is the last of the questions that I see here. Um, any final thoughts for folks? Um, yeah, like it, we, I talked a little bit about you don't have to offset 100% of your energy. Sometimes the sweet spot may be where you, you get the most tax benefit, and then you can always add to the system after you get it in but at least uh, get your toe in the water and, and get something and then uh, maximize your tax benefits while you're doing it and um, then you can sit back and enjoy it and, and watch your production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for being on the webinar today. Uh, thank you again to Frank and Chris from NYSERDA for presenting. And a reminder that our next webinar will be coming up on 
uh, Tuesday, February 11th at noon, and that's going to feature some folks from the Pollution Prevention Institute talking about greener um, cosmetic and personal care products. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And don't, and uh, the, the uh, community solar is perfect for renters, so you really want to think about it, okay?